All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing this wonderful space with us. Uh, my name is Chad Simmons. I'm the project coordinator for the Wyndham County Consortium on Substance Use. Thank you. Thank you. Love that energy. Thank you all. Um, no surprise, we'd like to start today's program with some stories. Uh, stories played a significant part in our work. So uh, let's take a few minutes to hear some stories. This time around, you know, when I got sober this time around, um, and when I say this time around, it's because it's, it, there's been multiple times in my, throughout my life that I've, I've been either forced to, to look at myself, um, to look at my disease and try to get treatment for it, or I've wanted to, and maybe was not at a place in my life where I was able to, to maintain mm -hmm. sobriety. Um, this time around, I didn't get any treatment. It was, like I said earlier, it was really a decision that I had to come to because of my life being so unmanageable. I put my hands up and said, okay, God, it's on you, um, kind of thing. But treatment is very important. And even in my life, um, because it planted a seed, you know, I knew where to go. And if I hadn't, you know, had access to various types of treatment in the past, although they were unsuccessful, in the end, um, the success was just delayed because I knew where to go. The seed was there. I knew. Again, a lot. I come from the point of just understanding and listening. Um, I think that if people listen to the individual, um, ask them what they hope for, what they dream about, what do they want out of this? Um, and it's right there. Um, I think that most will say, first, you know, give them some, they want their dignity, they want respect, they just want to be thought of as a person, um, to be given a chance to be a part of. And I think that's really where the spark starts. I knew that I could keep fighting and coming back because it was never, I, I never received an unwelcome feeling. It was always, it's okay, don't be afraid to come back, we're here. That was the best part. They need to be given the chance to make mistakes. They need to be given the chance to fall, but without it being a catastrophe, you know? And it's tough, I mean, even for society, for people who are not addicted and don't understand the disease, I, I, kind, of, I kind of feel for them too, because it's, it's, it's hard to understand sometimes, you know? It's hard for them to comprehend because they think it's a lack of moral more some some moral thing or you know um the absence of a moral compass altogether but you know how traumatizing it is for a person who does have morals and and prostitutes themselves in order to get a fix right um that person needs time again so you know um along the lines of the last question you had asked me residential living long-term treatment it's a must it's a must they need the opportunity to be able to fall and to fail without it being a catastrophe. At this point in my life, um, to not assume, um, to not make judgment without even knowing or checking out the book, open the book up, um, don't just look at the cover. One of the worst things you can do with a substance user is to judge them. It's the worst thing. And if you you need to tell them you love them nonstop. Just an example that they, all these people in my family, kids, grandkids, whatever, got to the point of substance use because they really felt unloved. They really felt like they weren't worthy of anything. There have been many times where I've felt stigmatized and discriminated, um, both for um, being an ex-con and for being a black Dominican. Uh, well, Great River Terrace is community to me, man. Um, like I said prior, I'm 42. I've never had a place to stay. I've never had a place that I was welcomed. Never mind on my own. Something that I can maintain and take care of that's mine is beyond bounds. So community, is these 22 or so apartments with everyone that lives in it and a ton of other people that come here on a regular basis and checks in on us 
and works with us um, and helps us get through these days and accepts us for who we are. Because I think that acceptance for who you are is what leads you to, to, to not be afraid to change. Because people aren't judging you on the mistakes that you make. They're judging you on the, on the thing that you try to do to better it. And I think that's what happens here. So those are some words and some stories from JR, Melvin, and Karen. And stories played and will continue to play a significant role in how we approach our efforts, uh, both as COSU and as a community. And we're going to hear more from JR, Melvin, and Karen, and others today um, throughout the day. Um, so first off, I want to uh, thank everyone for being here. I want to thank BCTV for filming. This is being streamed live so that other folks can uh, participate and experience this um, and will be recorded. Um, today's program, we're going to go through some introduction and context. Uh, we're going to uh, walk through uh, how we approached our, our, our work and uh, what we learned and uh, detail a five-point action strategy for our community to take collectively. Um, we'll then go into a little bit of detail on what it will take to move these efforts forward and where COSU can go from here, where we can go from here. Uh, finally, we're going to end today with uh, about a half hour of a question and answer session. So I'll ask some questions and then invite the public and press to, uh, to answer some, ask some questions as well. Um, and then we'll close uh, just around noon. So who is COSU? Um, Becky will go into this in just a few minutes, um, but the, the, the short story is, is we formed in 2018 and organized as a study group. Uh, we are currently 15 members representing 14 agencies and organizations. Uh, COSU is expanding and kind of evolving, so we'll be, um, we'll be in touch with you on how you can be involved with our efforts. Uh, we value equity, vulnerability, curiosity, and focus on systems change rather than individual choices. In thinking about how to talk um, and share what we've experienced and what we learned, um, I, I really got connected with Kate O'Neill's pieces from Seven Days. Just out of curiosity, how many folks have read or, um, or know about Kate O'Neill's pieces from Seven Days? So a good number uh, of folks. Um, I highly encourage folks to, to take a look at uh, what she's been writing um, in, in the series, um, st Hooked, Stories and Solutions from Vermont's Opioid Crisis. It's some of the best writing and most poignant, powerful uh, storytelling I've ever read. Um, but in her last piece around, um, uh, around pregnancy and opioids and substance use, she goes on to say, but what families experience is varied, complex, and rarely just about opioid use. In many cases, it is inextricably intertwined with some combination of poverty or homelessness or trauma, with polysubstance abuse and mental illness or domestic violence, with lack of transportation or lack of economic opportunity or lack of services. These families' lives are overseen by an intimately involved with a system so elaborate and opaque, after months of research, I'm not sure I have a realistic understanding of its most basic workings. It was the word opaque that gave me pause. Truth be told, it, it deeply saddened me. Impossible to understand and unfathomable should not be descriptions of our public health systems and supports. In our first listening session that we held in March, one person shared, it's easier to use than to jump through hoops. This should not be our norm. This should not be our dominant narrative we can do better for people, we can do better for our community. And while we heard many, struggle, uh, many stories of struggle and pain, we also heard stories of hope and resilience and recovery. And we wanna hold both of these truths up today and everything in between um, to better understand what's going on and why and how we can collectively move forward. So COSU embarked on this journey to make sense of what's happening in Wyndham County. Um, to provide a clear pathway forward and work towards collaboration. Our intent for today is for folks to know more about what's happening in Wyndham County, how, to, how we approach these efforts, and how we proposed to do something about it, encourage everyone to leave with some actionable step forward. So let's start that journey um, by learning a bit more about how we got here. Uh, Kurt White 
is the Senior Director of Ambulatory Services at the Brattleboro Retreat, and Kurt represents the retreat on COSU and is a co-chair of the current advisory board. He is also a phenomenal and hilarious storyteller and has sharpened my skills as a facilitator. Uh, please welcome Kurt White. Thank you, Chad, and thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, I don't have any slides for you. I think people are a little sick of slides these days, and I, maybe I'm sick of them. So I'm just going to talk for a little while. Um, not too long, though. Not too long. Not too, brevity is perhaps not my fort. I've been working at the retreat for about uh, 14 years, something like that. And uh, before that, in Western Mass and Holyoke, um, and uh, rather accidentally, uh, work with opioid addicted individuals has been a major focus of my career uh, that entire time. Uh, so now I'm, I'm what people would, would call an expert, uh, but really I'm just a, a learner, I think. I'm, I'm someone who's trying to uh, understand and make sense of what's been happening. Uh, I, I would be that as a psychotherapist, I think, in any event, but I think the opioid crisis has really uh, forced me to use uh, sort of every ounce of empathy and brain power to try to understand something happening that's really very different, I think, than, uh, than what happens uh, uh, most of the time. This, this opioid epidemic and the drug epidemic that we're in generally, because it isn't all just about opioids, um, is the challenge, the public health challenge of a generation or more. This is, a, this is a really, really, really big deal. And I wake up every morning uh, trying to find some energy to uh, tackle this problem in new and creative ways and to not let the uh, challenging reality of the world uh, get me down uh, overly much. Uh, I'm also always a little bit astounded when I look at the morning paper that the, the epidemic is not the front page news every single day because it's, it's a problem uh, literally of that magnitude. It was a big problem when I started at the retreat in 2005 and uh, the inpatient unit that I worked on at that time uh, which had historically mostly treated people for uh, alcohol use disorders, was starting to see uh, a large increase in the years before I got there and, and after I arrived in the number of people treated for um, acute opioid withdrawal and opioid addiction. Um, at that time, uh, every year, it got a little bit worse. And in 2008, this was a sort of a watershed year for lots of us in the treatment field because that was the year that total overdose deaths for any drugs uh, exceeded the uh, number of total deaths per year for auto accidents, right? That was, the, that was the worry we had for a long time, that that would eventually happen, and it happened in 2008. And we thought, well, this has got to be the bottom. It can't possibly get any worse than this. It's a, we're doing a lot of innovative things. We're probably going to turn the corner soon. But actually, really, the, the opposite happened, and things got uh, much, much, much worse after 2008. Um, you know, we're, we're at a point now where the total number of uh, overdose deaths for all drugs per year nationwide is over 70,000, 70,000 deaths. And most of that involves an opioid uh, and at least some part of it. Often involves other drugs too. Uh, cocaine in particular has been on the rise and has been mixed with other drugs like the new powerful potent opioids. Um, so it's gotten more than twice as bad, even just when you follow something as, uh, a, a sort, of a, as, as sort of clumsy a, st a statistic as just simply deaths, right? Because deaths are, don't tell the whole story. Um, it's, it's a, especially when they're on this scale. It's often a crisis that is affecting young people more than uh, than, it, than the older generation of folks. And it has really taken out, taken a big hit to a generation that was trying to come into its own during this time. 
I was really shocked one night uh, when I was watching 60 Minutes back in March, and they were interviewing uh, Fed Chief Jerome Powell, and uh, not about the opioid epidemic, just about the economy. He's an economist. And they said, uh, uh, Chairman Powell, why, why is it that the, the, we have not seen the kind of economic growth of previous generations uh, during this time of economic expansion? And he said, oh, it's, it's simple. It's the opioid epidemic. Uh, you can see it in the macroeconomic numbers. It sort of hit this generation so hard that, that whole communities, whole generation of young people haven't really been able to do what prior generations have done. And I thought, oh my God, you can see this in macroeconomic data. This is absolutely, this is absolutely terrifying. Of course, even that doesn't really tell the human story, does it? The human story has to do with the, the way that families are torn apart when they lose a loved one. You know, it's how do you ever really fully recover from that? Uh, families that uh, uh, perhaps have not lost a loved one, but have had to totally rearrange their lives and priorities to try to take care of and help people that are really out of control in their addictions. So how did we get here? How did we get here? It's a question I ask myself every week, and I'm still not sure. I mean, we can say things like, we know that the epidemic itself went through many phases, from uh, initially abused prescription drugs that then worked their way uh, into uh, people in the community that weren't prescribed them, and then that maybe built a market for new people to use, uh, including young people, got a hold of prescriptions, and then it it built a market in the illicit trade, and that started to travel on drug routes. And then that switched over to heroin, and then heroin started getting mixed with fentanyl that's coming from overseas. Fentanyl, fentanyl, which I used to, when I used to teach this, I used to say, don't worry much about fentanyl, because you'll never see it in your career. Now it's in the supply everywhere, and just a few grains of this can, can kill uh, an adult, even someone as large as I am, you know, something like that. It's very powerful, very potent. And so why do people use it? Well, that's a complicated question too, isn't it? It's one I get asked a lot, and it doesn't also have a simple answer. No one, no one grows up, uh, no one as a, as a child says, I want to grow up and get addicted to fentanyl or heroin. That just doesn't happen. Um, these are drugs that are so powerful, they work in very ancient uh, parts of the brain. They evolved in an ancient way, I mean to say, uh, that are meant to help us survive, help us know what to do to survive as an individual and survive as a species. Isn't that a terrible irony? that these drugs that are meant to help the individual and the community survive, uh, these mechanisms in the brain that are meant to do that, are being hijacked by drugs and causing the exact opposite reaction, death and destruction and communities torn apart. They're so powerful that they attack the person's ability to make a rational choice. It's one of the one of the few things in the world that can override basic instincts like uh, a mother's wish to take care of a child above all else, right? So, so we see uh, uh, childhood uh, removals from custody on the rise in Vermont at an incredibly alarming rate. It's basically a, a poison in the deep brain that uh, hijacks the brain and causes it to think that it needs to have this above absolutely anything else scary as heck. Don't get too depressed, though. Uh, uh, it's okay. I mean, it's not really okay, but you're going to hear a lot about recovery. Recovery is possible, and treatment really helps, you know? It helps. Otherwise, I would have abandoned this and started doing some other thing. I'm much less worried about the people who are in treatment getting good help today than those that are out there and struggling. Of course, this is also a challenge for us, isn't it? Because you can't treat an empty chair, as the old saying goes. And we have a lot of really uh, complicated individuals that are not making it into care, not, not into treatment, sometimes not into peer supports. They're, they're disconnected, they're alienated. And, and it's that group that I think is dying at the greater rate now. When we talk about uh, most vulnerable individuals, it's, it's this kind of thing that I'm trying to, that we are trying to get at here in COSU. Who, who is really the person that needs the most from us as a community? Now, this whole epidemic has, I think, 
uh, daily, regularly challenged all of us to, to think in new ways and to feel, I think, in new ways. It is that sort of the, the sort of mental organ of empathy has to grow, I think, to understand the ways that this problem is affecting uh, this whole generation of individuals. What else do I want to say about this? You know, there's, sometimes there's a line where you say, well, addiction can affect anybody, and boy, is that true, right? It cuts across uh, uh, race and gender and, and economic lines. Uh, we don't need too much evidence for that. And yet, if we say that, maybe we end up with a little bit of a misunderstanding, that it affects everyone equally. And I don't think that's true, actually. Uh, it, it seems to affect those that already have had a few strikes against them in the world, who are already a bit alienated, who are already in a one-down position. Major obstacles uh, come about when people don't have opportunities, when they have trauma in their lives, especially at a young age, when they suffer discrimination, when they grow up in poverty, when they don't have hope or meaning or a sense of purpose. They become more likely to use and develop addictive problems, compulsive use. Experimentation turns into compulsive use at greater rates. These are very difficult obstacles to overcome. Uh, and we need to look not just at addiction as an individual problem, although in a way it is, right? And people have to have a kind of a, an accountability for what they're going through or else uh, they won't get better, right? But there are systematic ways that people are excluded from having a meaningful life. Generational trauma and addiction, racism and discrimination, social isolation, poverty and economic inequality. With that as the background, it's really not hard to see how this epidemic has developed to this incredibly concerning this conversation is a complex one, I think, because it asks us to look at the roots of this problem and to diagnose not the individual, but the community and maybe the larger world, and to intervene on multiple levels of inference. It's sometimes said that epidemics, of epidemics, that we don't really solve them, that we live through them, that we need to keep people alive and work on prevention. I think that's true to an extent, although it implies a more passive position than I'm willing to take. I think we need to work like hell to make sure that everybody who can survive, survives. And to not rest until we're helping the most vulnerable individual in our community. When will that day come? I'm not sure, but the work of COSU has been inspiring for me personally, and I think you'll find it so for the community, and I look forward to continuing this process and to, and to sharing with you also what my colleagues have to say about it, and I'll stop there. So, I think a common theme that we have, uh, an attribute of, of those of us that have been doing this work is that we are gonna work like hell to figure this out. Um, and that's exactly what we've been doing over the last year. Um, and so, as a good friend of mine has once told me, and, and I learned from, that the process is often the product. And we dove deep into process this last year because it was so important for us to model the systems and the, uh, the, the solutions that we wanted in the community. So we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about how we went about learning and then what we ended up uh, uncovering. Um, and I'd like to invite Becky Burns to the stage. And Becky is the Director of Community Initiatives for Brattleboro Memorial Hospital and a COSU member and co-chair of the advisory board. Uh, Becky and I share a healthy love for sarcasm, um, so that's been an enjoyable ac uh, aspect of being at the COSU table, and I welcome Becky to the stage. Thank you, Chad. So while we tend to think of strategic planning in terms of finding the solution, it's important to understand the process and how we got to this point today. In 2018, COSU was formed with funding 
from a Health Resources and Services Administration Rural Community Opioid Response Program Planning Grant, also called HRSA. Organized, <laughs> I know, it's a really long name. So we organized a study group to understand the following. How do we reduce harm caused by opioid and other substance use, specifically related to death and disease, and supporting harm reduction along with access to treatment in our community? How do we mend harm that's been caused by opioid and other substance use, focusing on building and supporting recovery? How do we create hope, connection, and wellness while supporting collaboration and prevention in our communities across Wyndham County? So how we learned. The COSU assessment process consisted of five primary components, equity and structure, tools, focus groups and forums, analysis, and strategic action and development. We started with equity and structure. COSU was very intentional in making equity a part of the assessment process. We wanted to hear from people that were most impacted by this disease. We hired equity solutions to provide trainings and support to COSU. The goal was to understand most impacted with substance use disorder in our communities and how it intersects with race and class. This disease impacts each of us differently and to varying degrees, as Kurt pointed out. In partnership with Equity Solutions, we hired Rework, led by Claire Wheeler, to guide us in understanding how we structure our group. She encouraged systems-level thinking and moving us from a focus on individual behavior or choices to the assumptions, beliefs, and values that shape the very systems that we work in. So what did this mean for COSU in practice? It provided us with leading trauma-informed focus groups and community forums. We focused on building relationships and connections within each Wyndham County community. We had an emphasis on structural changes and systems changes. With people from our focus groups, we are developing pathways to leadership to help shape COSU and our work moving forward. The tools that we used, we started by cataloging existing programs, services, supports, specific to prevention, harm reduction, treatment, recovery, justice, and communication, focusing on best practices in these areas. We collabor collaboratively built tools to ask questions in the focus groups to collect stories and data for analysis with a focus on building relationships with each and every member of the group. COSU held 27 trauma-informed focus groups across Wyndham County, including forums as well. We used SAMHSA's six principles of trauma-informed care while leading these groups that focused on safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment and choice, taking into account cultural and historical issues along with gender, moving past stereotypes and biases. After the focus groups were completed, we had an analysis period. We reviewed all the focus group responses. We collected data. We did research. We read articles. We found the best practices identified the higher level themes and trends that presented themselves. So in the analysis, we reviewed everything, as I, as I said, and then we went into the strategic action and development. What I do want to point out is specifically the themes and trends that we saw. They were complex. There was not one solution identified. There was no easy way to solve the problem. It touches on so many issues. We learned that it demands a full community approach, social service, law enforcement, government, businesses, healthcare cannot address the issue alone or solve the problem. We need to work in partnership. A high level theme was the need, to, the need for improved collaboration. We work really well together, but we have to do it better. We have to be honest with each other. We have to hold each other accountable and really push each other to be creative and innovative. 
we need to look at stigma and discrimination. This was a very common theme in the focus groups that we had with people that were most impacted. We have to meet people where they're at, not be judgmental. We have to have a very compassionate approach. We need to increase and improve harm reduction efforts. We need to focus on infrastructure, such as transportation and housing and access to services. We need to develop an actual pathway to recovery and provide treatment at all levels. We need to increase training on substance use disorder, not only for the professionals in our community, but for our community as a whole to understand what treatment truly is. And we need to work on prevention, halting the cycle of substance use disorder. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Um, so that provides some context for uh, why we're here and how we've gotten to uncover some of the action steps that we're proposing. Um, and as folks are walking in, I encourage you, if you haven't gotten one, um, to pick up a handout that details kind of what we're uh, looking to address, the uh, outcome measures that we are going to hold ourselves accountable to, um, and then the five action areas that we're proposing. Um, so to dive into that, we're going to spend the next half hour. Um, so each speaker will talk very briefly about some very complex things um, that we're proposing uh, that we do as a community. And um, I'd like to invite our first action step speaker, um, who is no stranger to the stage. Um, Ella Thorne Thompson is a Pathways Guide for Vermont Recovery Network and a tenacious advocate for humans. Ella and I, Ella and I also uh, just so happen to share our first electric scooter experience, uh, ricocheting through the streets of Atlanta um, that uh, helped us grow uh, a bond and I really appreciated that, that moment. So I want to welcome to the stage, Ella. Disclaimer, there is, as Chad alluded to, a lot of material to be covered in five minutes. Um, it's a lot, it's complex, uh, and yeah, brevity is not my middle name, as Kurt <coughs> mentioned about himself, but uh, anyway, so I am a person in long-term recovery from opioid use disorder myself. Um, I used heroin and other narcotics on and off, illicit narcotics on and off for many years. Um, the last six, though, I've been in recovery and, and the entirety of my recovery journey has taken place here in Brattleboro, um, which I, thank you so much. Yes, 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 thank you. I mention it only for the applause. Um, it's not pertinent at all. No, um, yeah, but, um, uh, I'm, also, I'm also a mother. Um, I work at the Turning Point of Wyndham County, which is a peer recovery center. Woo, 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 thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so, but um, what I did, I did want to kind of say is that um, talking about discrimination and um, stigma and the impact that they have on people's ability to find um, ma and maintain recovery and really find joy in life. Um, is that I know for myself I was truly blessed. I had people in my life when I was using, um, I can think of one person in particular, my dad, who um, whenever I was going through something, you know, I would leave a treatment facility after two days or um, I would have a, you know, I'd go back out and pick up again or whatever the case may be. Um, I always knew I had someone out there in the world that was gonna pick up the phone, tell me that they love me and say that, they wouldn't settle for anything less than me having a good life. Um, and I, I feel truly blessed to have that because in my work as a recovery coach uh, and my work as a pathway guide, I have met so many people who have not been lucky enough to have somebody in their lives that welcome them with open arms no matter what, what action, whatever their disease of addiction, whatever action that had caused them to take. Um, so stigma and discrimination have um, an impact that sometimes I know when I started this work, I, I kind of underestimated it um, and the emphasis that we place on some of the things that we'll be, I'll be covering briefly, theoretically. Um, anyway, so um, stigma and discrimination are 
So often, as we know, um, I think from, what was it, the, the Bush era, war, well, from back to the, the Reagan, just say, say no to drugs. Um, there's been the assumption that um, someone suffering from a substance use disorder, it's a moral failing. There's something corrupt about them as a person, in their soul, in their spirit. And it's been really a big challenge to rewrite that history with the amazing information that we have now, thanks to incredible research done by so many different organizations. Um, we now know that, as Kurt said, that this is a disease, a chronic disease of the brain, where these ancient um, systems in our brains get hijacked and um, our higher functions and our, our reasoning don't stand a chance in the face of, of this um, chemical onslaught. So, um, but so unfortunately, folks get um, victimized by the fact that um, you know, we, they wind up suffering from a judgment that's based on, you know, about an entire group of people, or sometimes about an individual. Oh, I knew this one drug addict who, you know, they left their kid in the car while they went to get high, or this or that, and, oh, you're a drug addict too, you must leave your child in the car and go get high, this, that, and the other. Um, so having people suffer, not, not being able to operate as an individual and be taken at face value as who they are and met with compassion and empathy and understanding that this is a, this is a disease that requires treatment and understanding. Um, and I know for myself, um, I was very, very sensitive to language. Um, and so there's a wonderful tool that's been created by some folks that I imagine are listed up here on the slide, so you can just enjoy reading about that. Um, but anyways, it, it's amazing. Uh, I know when I started this work, I, I didn't really believe um, that I needed to take as much care with my language as I, as I do now um, when talking about, or especially talking to people who are struggling with substance use disorder. Um, because there, this is a you know, I know for myself, I still feel sensitive. I feel like I'm at on, in the moral low ground because I'm someone with a, a history of substance use disorder. Um, I am hypersensitive to someone calling me an addict or a junkie or saying that um, I had a, a dirty, you know, drug test or whatever. Because instead of saying, you know, using purely clinical terminology, which oh, you either had a negative drug screen where you didn't test positive for any substances, or you had a positive drug screen. This is this is. Um, this is value-neutral language, where it doesn't, doesn't assert that this person is dirty or clean as an individual. So um, just take a look at some of these examples, um, which I could go through, but we don't have time. Um, but just some really good ways that we can rework the language that we use so that we, when we do have the opportunity to talk to either someone struggling themselves or someone who's going to interact with someone who's struggling, um, they might be able to learn a little something and have that interaction be po much more positive um, and couched with more accepting, compassionate language. Because um, every interaction that we have with someone who is either struggling themselves or with a person who may then go on to interact with someone who's struggling, those interactions are an opportunity for that person to get connected um, if they feel that that is an accepting, supportive, welcoming um, person on the other end of the uh, conversation, or it's an opportunity to be to feel judged and have that momentum shoot you off in the other direction. I know for myself, um, shame, um, disappointment in myself, um, anger at other people, these were amazing negative motivators that drove me more to use because I could erase those feelings. Maybe it only lasted for 15 minutes, but I could forget that I felt scorned and I felt like nobody cared about me and I felt like I was a horrible human being and was never going to be able to make up for these, these decisions their mistakes that I had made in my life. Um, so giving someone the feeling of being accepted and having a handout and someone that is willing to say, I just want to hear your experience. I just want to, what do you hope for yourself? There was just some wonderful, um, some wonderful stuff from the folks in that video. So anyways, so moving right along. Um, yeah, so we, COSU found um, during the course of our, our research in the last year. Um, there are some things that Brattleboro is already doing an outstanding job um, at doing to impact stigma and discrimination. Uh, and one of them was um, having public community events like this right here. Um, and the, the event at the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center, um, a, uh, a exposition put on by a, a local artist, Michael Poster, called If She Has a Pulse, She Has a Chance. Um, so amazing community events like this where you can put a face on recovery and substance use and have conversations that will hopefully um, open people's minds and hope, 
hopefully have people start to recognize individuals instead of um, whatever assumptions they have about um, substance use. Thank you. Um, so we have some, like I said, really wonderful things going on. Um, the retreat has their Stand Up to Stigma campaign. Um, and um, we have been trying to do a lot of different trainings. Um, one of the really exciting, wait, okay, where is that thing? Cool, there we go. Um, so yeah, uh, one of the really wonderful things that we've gotten to do because of COSU is put on, um, for myself at the turning point, it's been exciting, uh, put on some short um, recovery coaching trainings where for two days, uh, we did one in Londonderry, we did one in Wilmington, all over the place. People can come in, either folks with personal experience of substance use or really anyone in the community who wants to impact this issue. Uh, they can come for two days and get trained um, on how to think about and talk about substance use in a compassionate, accepting um, way so that when we, you have the opportunity to talk to someone, we can move the issue forward instead of um, uh, fortifying old, old thinking patterns of it being a moral failing and yada, yada, yada. I'm so glad I have these slides. Isn't it? Isn't everyone having fun? Yes. Ah, so apparently that's the end. I hope you know that stigma and discrimination are isolating factors and that um, addiction thrives in isolation. Um, yeah, it, it can just reinforce itself. So the fact that you guys are all here today um, listening and being open-minded and you clapped, gosh darn it, when I told you that I used to use drugs a lot, that's pretty exciting for me. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Ella. Um, so moving, or trading discrimination for dignity is our first action area that we are proposing and um, how important it is as a foundational point to start from. Um, so our next speaker is going to discuss harm reduction and safe use. Um, Sue Conley is the prevention program manager for the AIDS Project of Southern Vermont. I met Sue uh, a number of years ago while doing prevention work in Bellows Falls and have always appreciated her calm and gentle approach to this work that we're doing. So please welcome Sue Conley. Thank you everyone. So I run the prevention program at the um, AIDS Project of Southern Vermont, um, which includes, I run the syringe service program. So that program is um, part of what I do is work with people on the, in the harm reduction model or the principle. Um, one of the biggest things that I do with people is to build relationships with people and work to gain their trust. Because sometimes some of the first people, the first person that they may see, or the only person that they may see, is me. Um, they come to my program to get um, new needles, harm reduction supplies, and most of the time, people who are using, use in isolation, like Ella said. And they've experienced stigma, they've experienced um, people not treating them well. So when they come to me, they, I build this relationship and one of the first things that I do when they walk in the door is I say, I'm so glad to see you. So when they come, they're feeling, they're not feeling judged and they're feeling as if they're accepted, which is one of the themes that we're talking about. And part of the services piece of what I do is not just hand out new needles, but also to provide an ear, to provide resource and referrals when someone is ready to get into treatment, if and when, then I can help them move them into treatment. Because they've already, they trust me and they believe that I'm here to help. So. Thank you. So what is harm reduction? I'm gonna kind of read this. So harm reduction is grounded in justice and human rights. It focuses on positive change and on working with people without judgment, coercion, discrimination, 
are requiring that they stop using drugs as a precondition of support. Syringe service programs and harm reduction model or philosophy believes in what we do is we provide services such as HIV and hepatitis C testing, linkage to care, and other really crucial health substance use disorder treatment and social services, as well as affirming the human rights and dignity of people who use. Syringe service programs provides many different things for people. Uh, we provide new needle sterile equipment. We provide safe disposal. When people come into my program, I give them a sharps container, and then they bring back their used needles to me. I, we provide uh, tr uh, referrals for mental health treatment. We provide Narcan to help people stay alive. Uh, we actually, at our program, we have a clinic for uh, that um, a nurse, public health nurse comes in once a month and provides hepatitis A and B vaccinations. Uh, we provide, get my glasses, um, other tools to help prevent um, things like condoms, we do HIV and hepatitis C testing, referral to substance use disorder treatment, and a nice ear to listen to. So what saves lives? What the COSU and the harm reduction is, uh, have been working on is to expand syringe services programs in the county. Um, there are, there, Wyndham County is so huge that it's really difficult for people in the areas that uh, can't get to Brattleboro because we're the only um, in southern Vermont. Well, we just opened in Bennington as well, which, yeah, I'm really excited about. <laughs> but we do so much more than just hand out sterile syringes. We really are a place that people can come to and when they're ready um, to um, get into treatment or for any health related issues, then I refer them. So we're trying to expand certain services programming in Wyndham County. We want to improve naloxone distribution and training because obviously uh, Narcan saves lives and we can't help anyone if they're not alive. Uh, we ex we're exploring um, creative overdose prevention spaces and best practices. Uh, we are enhancing and increasing safe use best practice, and we're training and support use, safe use ambassadors. So there it is. There you go. That's what we're doing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, so um, we move from harm reduction to safe use to building connection and hope. And so our next speaker describes herself as a perfectly imperfect human being and a compulsive connector. Um, she just so happens to be the community outreach coordinator um, for Greater Falls Connections. And I've learned more from Deb um, about class, vulnerability, and relationships than any other graduate course or book could possibly uh, provide, and stories are what binds us. So please welcome to the stage, Deb Witkus. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm nervous, and um, I always like to model vulnerability. Uh, this is really hard for me. Um, I grew up in generational poverty, and I have, uh, see, I'm already starting to get verklempt. Um, but I've, I've, um, I'm one of 10, and I learned so much from my siblings and my families. And I would have to say, um, we can break the cycle of addiction. Um, it, it is totally possible. We need, we need innovation, creativity. Uh, we need to rethink the way that we are collaborating, and we need to mostly think about the way that we're connecting. 
Um, Johan Hari, uh, who is, um, I met him up in Burlington. He is amazing. I gave him a big hug. I think I almost broke him. Uh, and, and he has a very, he has a very similar um, family story as well. And he knows from a real intimate perspective um, what it's like to um, have family members struggle with addiction. People you love and you see how they have had dreams and hopes that have just disappeared. Um, because in my case, in my family, it's, uh, usually, it, you know, we're like a seven on the trauma scale, on the A scale. We got a lot of trauma there. And um, anyhow, but that's enough about me. I made myself wicked vulnerable. I want to talk about the community where I've been working for the past 10 years. Um, I've been, I had the pleasure and the honor of working with families and youth um, in uh, Rockingham, specifically Bellows Falls out of Parks Place. And um, I have been listening and learning for so long. And I'm, I'm so humbled by the strength and um, the resiliency of the families that I've met who've been struggling with generational poverty and generational oppression. Addiction does not happen in a vacuum. You know, if you look at it from an economic um, standpoint, you know, you see all these um, uh, factories and mills that once provided, um, you know, jobs and a sense of um, community for lots of folks, and those jobs aren't here anymore. Uh, one of my best and first teachers was um, Brent Lee Sai, who said, you know, we didn't have this problem when people had jobs. You know, he's been in the community for a really long time, and he's seen how it's changed. Um, anyhow, I'm all over the place, and I'm so nervous. So talking about what we've been doing up in Bellows Falls, first and foremost, we are creating a rural response. What does that mean? That means going to the communities, going where people are. So we've done trainings at, um, through Grafton Cares out in Grafton, where we're bringing information, trying to connect them with recovery coaches, trying to rec um, connect them with um, family support. Looking at this, not, about, not through um, an individual lens, but families. Um, the other thing we're, we've done is we've gone to churches where we've done trainings, Narcan trainings, um, we've done prevention trainings, and we're doing an integrated multi-discipline model. So we're not just talking about recovery or treatment, but we're wrapping it all together. So it's a continuum um, because families don't just like, uh, you know, this whole opioid epidemic, it's not just affecting individuals, it's playing itself out in families, cross generations, and um, the other thing we've been doing is, um, thanks to Mike Johnson, I, I don't know if Mike is out there, um, he really has inspired us. Um, Mike, are you out there somewhere? Oh, I don't think he's here today. But um, he started a group called Family Addiction and Recovery, which we're doing in Bellows Falls, which is a two-generation approach. And we have grandparents and um, grandkids, mothers, fathers, brothers, aunts, uncles, who are... Um, receiving support, you know, figuring out how do you support your loved one who's currently in active use? How do you know when they're, you know, being manipulative or, and how do you love them through everything unconditionally? How do you respond, you know, when your, um, your granddaughter's going out to buy some fentanyl um, on the street? How can you keep your kids safe? Um, so that's one thing we're doing. Um, that's also a very trauma-informed, it's community-driven, peer-based group. Uh, another thing that we're doing to increase connections is raising kids in recovery. Thanks, thanks, uh, Chad. Do you want to move that forward? Thank you. Okay. Well, um, we're doing another group called Raising Kids in Recovery. And what I love about that group, it was actually designed with a peer. Um, it's trauma-informed. Uh, it's, a, it's a really... Um, Unusual and creative and innovative approach. We have play, we have vulnerability, reciprocity, um, all embedded into the design, and um, it's peer-led. Uh, let's see, satellite locations, we've done that. So we're going out to um, places that you actually wouldn't think, like work sites, and we're doing trainings there that are integrating prevention, recovery, treatment, everything that you want. Um, let's see. Increased support models for health and social service providers. I know um, Cassandra um, from uh, Brattleboro 
um, Area Prevention Co Coalition has been doing a lot of work um, reaching out to all of our um, first responders, at those who are on the front lines, and actually offering support and connection for them um, because they are, you know, it, this work, um, you know, you, it is really um, traumatizing, you know, seeing and having to deal with um, everything on a daily basis. Uh, let's see what else. I'm so nervous, can you tell? <laughs> Um, the other thing is um, the youth that we get to work uh, with in um, Bellows Falls, they are breaking the cycle, and that's because the connections are intentional. We are listening to them. We're not doing this for them. We're doing it with them. Um, everything that we do um, is meant to empower them so that they have voice, choice, reciprocity, that they are actually leading, um, and we're moving back. Um, so that they can take the lead. It's their stories that have inspired us that should be shaping our policies um, and um, our programs. How's that, Chad? <laughs> um, and finally, um, I guess another um, action item here is to invest in our public spaces and places. And I know sometimes this can be done with policy changes. I know I had a kid come up to me last week and said, Deb, uh, you know, can you get them to open up the gyms? I just want to play basketball. This kid is so at risk. His dad died, you know, uh, two years ago. He is surrounded by families, members who love him, who are also in active addiction. This kid is looking for something to hold on to. And if we could, like, develop policy within our town so we had shared use agreements, so we can open up our gyms and our public spaces so kids can make connections, so families can make connections. That would be amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deb. And I just want to spend a minute to just mention something about spaces. So we are in a phenomenally wonderful, beautiful space. I remember moving to Brattleboro 14 years ago and first coming in these doors and just being, I grew up in central Wisconsin. We didn't have anything like this as a kid to go and watch films. And um, films don't just happen in this space. Community happens in this space. And I have been fortunate enough to be on this stage a number of times for events like this. And I just want to thank John and the staff at the Latches for opening up your doors to community and for making connection happen right here in Brattleboro. So thank you. So we've been talking a lot about collaboration and the need for collaboration. And Wyndham County does collaboration really well. But we still need to go a bit further. We still need to understand what that looks like and how we can improve our collaborative efforts to meet people where they're at and save lives and build connection. So our next um, presenter is uh, going to talk a bit about what collaboration looks like through the lens of COSU. Susie Walker is a person in long-term recovery and director of Turning Point of Wyndham County. I'm deeply enjoyed Susie's ability to walk into complex situations and meet it with smiles, laughs, and poise. Please welcome Susie Walker. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a little nervous all of a sudden, but up until this moment, I've just been so captivated by the stories and um, being reminded of the work that we've been doing. So I, I thank all my partners for that, the laughter and the little tears. Um, as Chad said, I'm, uh, in addition to being the director of Turning Point, I'm also a person in long-term recovery. And for me, that means I haven't had a drink in um, over 21 years. I'm thank you. Thank you. I'm also a person in family recovery, and long before I ever knew that I had a problem, my mom had already uh, started attending Al-Anon meetings for the alcoholic in her life who was my dad. And what I know, and I didn't know it at the time, but at the time I saw this sudden shift in the way our family operated. <laughs> and um, instead of like orbiting around the person in pain, she reset our 
family orbit, and we tried to, and we hoped we would draw him in. And so I experienced recovery before I even had developed my own problem, and so um, I've always had an amazement for how resilient uh, people can be. And, and it's a privilege to get to work with some folks uh, in this capacity. Um, I'll speak briefly about collaboration regarding Turning Point. It's always been part of our strategy um, in working with partners in drawing them into the center. We talk about meeting people where they are. And so by having our partners come to the center to do services, uh, we can, you know, our people are right there. Uh, we also discovered maybe two or three years ago that the more we're out of the building, the more that happens at the building. And so we've been doing a lot more connection uh, with partners, um, meeting their clients and patients where they are. And a recent example is uh, the last, I don't know, maybe five, six months, we've been going over every Wednesday to the Great River Terrace. Uh, is described so beautifully in that video. It's such a beautiful com uh, community. And so we're there just um, building relationships and talking about recovery. And last month, um, a couple of their folks went to the Recovery Coach Academy and became trained peers. Uh, one of their residents is um, volunteering at the center now. And it's just amazing to uh, be able to see those things happen. Um, as Ella mentioned, uh, part of collaboration for us is also working with unexpected partners. And Michael Poster's um, Faces of Recovery exhibit last year was just so powerful. It was just a new venue to be able to talk about these issues that touch so many of us. And, um, and, and related to that, because it, it connects with pictures, uh, the Vermont Center for Photography, as of this past Sunday, started a new program um, that is teaching six people in recovery the basics of photography and photo editing as a new way uh, to be able to tell their stories. And they got some grant funding to do this, and they've been just so eager. And then at the end of this, I forget, six or eight weeks, uh, there will be a public exhibit so these folks can can tell their stories because some of us are very wordy and some of us tell our stories through movement or photos or through our artwork. And um, I think what we see often in people in recovery is we have this need to express and to get um, our feelings out and to be able to make that connection with the world in ways that maybe we didn't learn how to do earlier on in life. Um, so, okay, what is collaboration? Um, uh, the strong partnerships that already exist in our community, what I've seen happen through uh, COSU is that uh, we have a lot of very vital partnerships, but um, in using the equity framework and, and vulnerability especially, and the other things that Chad and others have mentioned, we have um, taken our partnerships to a new level of collaboration. And um, one thing that's been really meaningful for me that I want to mention is um, when we come together for our COSU meetings, it occurred to us that uh, people who are um, struggling with substance use disorder as, you know, personally or as a family member or maybe as an employer, um, often have to go and seek services. And when they do, they have to go to, you know, sometimes several people, and when they arrive, they have to tell the most painful, embarrassing um, aspects of their lives so that they can prove that they need help. And then if they get the help, they then, you know, have to jump through the hoops that have been mentioned previously. So when we came together as a COSU, um, when we start our meetings, we start at a place of vulnerability. We talk about where we really are as human beings, who we're bringing into the room that day. And more than just a little check-in, ah, I'm doing fine, it's this crazy thing at work is um, a real hassle. It's we talk about what's actually going on with us as fellow human beings, so we can put ourselves in a place of vulnerability that the people we're hoping to serve 
Um, those people do that all the time, and they have so many things expected of them that I've really appreciated um, my COSU partners for their vulnerability. Um, let's see, I'm jumping all over the place. Uh, we're enriching and strengthening countywide partnerships. As, as uh, Ella mentioned, we've been doing trainings around the county because uh, one, not everybody can get to Brattleboro where so many of the services are, but two, people shouldn't have to leave their communities to get the help that they need. And so our goal as COSU is to help the people um, in the surrounding areas have the, the training and the resources that they need so that the people in their communities can have that support right in their own neighborhoods. That's our goal. Um, and, and through all of this, we've developed a lot of trust with each other. Um, I guess you can look ahead. <laughs> Oh, these are just some examples of um, some collaboration. Um, the Michael posters exhibit at the museum. Uh, storytelling is just a huge part of uh, what really helps us make those human connections and reach people's hearts in a way that gets past the discrimination and stigma. Uh, we had a storytelling event last month at the Next Stage Arts Center in Putney uh, it's called Fables. It's one of Peter Fish's uh, ongoing events each month. And so for the month of August, people told their recovery stories. And it was amazing. And so this is some of our hospital partners in the audience supporting those speakers. Um, and we go up to the State House every, usually February, for uh, Recovery Advocacy Day. So there's our program coordinator, Don Curden, overseeing the State House. And I forget what the other picture is. I can't see it from here. But. Oh, I know what it is. It's the uh, police and firefighters and rescue uh, first responders at an appreciation lunch. Uh, September is recovery month. I forgot that for a moment. But every uh, September, we do appreciation lunches for uh, the folks, and especially our partners, who do so much to um, bring awareness to what really is effective in helping people. Um, some examples of collaboration are embedded services. Um, we have, as I mentioned earlier, if our partners come to us and provide services out of our center, our, our center guests are already there and it doesn't become yet one more referral or phone number that they have to access. They're, they're right there and they can get the support that they need. In the same way we go out and do um, recovery supports in other places, our newest venture is with the Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, where our uh, recovery coaches are working out of the emergency department. So they are available there when people have overdoses or they uh, have some kind of substance use um, incident where they need uh, and could perhaps benefit from talking with a recovery coach. So that's been pretty amazing. Other embedded programs include, um, we also do some services at the Brattleboro Retreat, and the Groundworks Collaborative has an embedded uh, registered nurse from the hospital as well. So these are all ways where we can uh, remove some of the barriers, you know, less hoop jumping, that you don't have to go and do this other thing or make this other call, because we'll bring it to you, or if we'll bring it to where you are. Um, Warm handoffs, uh, my goodness, it's part of the same um, problem that often when people leave one service to go to another, they maybe get a pack of flyers and brochures and some phone numbers, and there's just a staggering um, statistic of, of people who don't make it from one place to the next. So anything that we can do to build bridges so that people actually get there, um, I know one of our, uh, uh, stars at, at Turning Point saw me at the uh, Brattleboro Retreat Starting Now program presenting uh, three times over 18 months and it was the third time he decided no right now today I'm going to go and um, his trajectory over the next few years was amazing he became a volunteer he became um, a trained trainer so he could help others he became our pathway guide at the time and now he, uh, he works for one of our partners and is, is still a partner with us at the Center for Recovery Supports. 
So um, it's just amazing the things that can happen um, if you can actually accompany somebody to that appointment or if you can make an arrangement for someone to come to wherever the person is. It really, it really helps people who are already scared and um, stressed. Let's see. Rural areas, we've talked about that a lot. That um, there's, and it's been amazing. There's some. Uh, there's this place called Neighborhood Connections out in Londonderry. Um, so are, there are these pockets of um, services and enthusiasm that we've been learning from too. So uh, one, we want to be uh, sure that people who need um, supports in other areas are getting that. And uh, part of our approach to collaboration is we can learn from what others are doing too. And so we've been doing that. Okay, we're trying to have a community-driven impact. Um, I used to think in terms of uh, that we, we have a pretty recovery-oriented community. I know even just having Turning Point downtown when we got our building and moved back, um, I know in other parts of the state that there's some of the not in my backyard syndrome that gets in the way of, of providing these necessary services. And we've never had that. We've always felt embraced and understood or that people would feel free to come and, and meet us if, if there was something they didn't understand. Um, and countywide trauma informed, we see the effects of trauma every day and it affects people um, in ways that some of us just would never even think about. And so the more we can learn to have sensitivity and compassion, the more we can draw people into a, a healing circle. Um, recovery uh, ready employment opportunities. Uh, Deb Wickes is and her folks have done a lot of work um, in working with employers to how can I as an employer have a, have a work environment that is supportive for people in recovery and how can I as an employer know what the needs might be and how can I connect people with recovery coaches so that they can see they can succeed in this job I really uh, want them to succeed at. Um, there's also a lot of work being done, um, largely driven from the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council work, um, that we need to train more people uh, to work in the substance use field in some capacity because we need the, the crisis is such that we need more helpers. We need more people who are willing to do this work. Um, and along the way, we're improving connections and doing trainings and relying on restorative justice techniques. And um, we're hoping that Wyndham County might get a drug court at some point so that uh, we can support people in ways that aren't adding um, you know, more challenges to their life. Where am I, Chad? I forget. <laughs> Just about there, all right. Um, some examples of the, I've mentioned along the way, our emergency department at the hospital has just been an amazing experience and our partners there so supportive and, uh, and having the coaches actually embedded there creates an opportunity for awareness and education. Uh, the project care collaborations, we're hoping that uh, maybe that's a model that could be um, adapted for in the more rural areas. Maybe they'd be working with the state police or maybe they'd uh, be working with their local, their local police. But we found here in Brattleboro that the project care model of having a police officer or two, a recovery peer or two, and mental health workers and folks from Groundworks going out to actually go and outreach where people are, wherever in town they might be, meet them as human beings, and not foist services on them, but just make it um, clear that we're available to help if, if, if they need or choose to do that. And then lastly, I'll say that we're excited about the idea of um, uh, having these outposts in, in various communities. The Wilmington Opioid uh, Group, uh, about a year and a half ago, they started a community group um, because they had had, uh, I think, three losses of young people, all, all pretty close together. They came together as a community and said, what can we do about this? 
So we started attending their meetings and learning from them, and along the way, they started participating in some of the COSU trainings that were happening, and uh, they've now got trained recovery coaches, and they're employing some of these ideas, and they'll be like, uh, like we can't have a turning point center in every little area, but we can have outposts, and they can, they can get support from turning point, and, and we can learn from them. So. Uh, we're seeing that that's a way collaboration and connectivity can really help us uh, to do better and do more. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. So these four areas, collaboration, connection, harm reduction, and trading discrimination for dignity are all areas that COSU is going to coordinate collaborate with and work towards, and essentially be responsible and held accountable for achieving these outcomes. The fifth area that we identified is a much larger, complex um, area that we have a lot of efforts going on in Wyndham County to, um, to address. Uh, but we needed and felt it was um, imperative that we include that in our action steps. So this area is around infrastructure and the social determinants of health to address poverty and mental health issues. And so I'd like to invite, uh, Ryanna Kendrick is um, from Groundworks Collaborative and is the director of operations there. She's a fierce champion of all humans and has helped me wrap my head around the complexities we see every day. Ryan uh, says things that I wanna say. Uh, so I often leave meetings and events like, oh, that was such an amazing nugget of information. I want to say things like that. Uh, so please welcome Rihanna Kendrick to the stage. Thanks, Chad, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, with Chad's encouragement, uh, I wanted to share some of the other hats that I wear, which is far beyond as the Director of Operations for Groundworks, which I'm quite proud of. I'm also a born and raised Vermonter, which I know is something that means a lot in many circles. Uh, and what it means to me is that this is my community. I was born here, I've grown up here, and I'm now raising my own children here, my 15-year-old daughter and my three-year-old foster son. I'm also a graduate level social work student, and I'm the current chair for the Wyndham South Continuum of Care, which is a systems group focused on finding solutions to end homelessness in our community. I say these things not to tell you that I am constantly tired and I rarely sleep, um, <laughs> but to say that I spend most of my time focused on trying to find solutions to help individual people and solutions to help work towards systemic change that's going to help those folks. I believe strongly that our community can only be successful when all people have their basic needs met. Throughout all of my roles, what I see most often is trauma. I work with and alongside people who have suffered incredibly painful experiences and times in their lives and are desperately seeking ways to help themselves feel better. More often now than ever, we see that people are seeking substances as a way to help cope with trauma and pain. I often share an anecdote about the seasonal overflow shelter, which I have now been a part of for the past five years. Five years ago, our biggest challenge in the shelter was around alcohol use and the behaviors associated when people may have had too much to drink. When we reached last year, our biggest concern was that overnight somebody might die from substance use uh, overdose. I really appreciate this quote from Dr. Carl Hart, a neuroscientist and a Columbia professor. He says, what I now know is that drugs themselves are not the problem. The real problems are poverty, unemployment, selective drug law enforcement, ignorance, and the dismissal of science regarding these drugs. We often focus so much on the drugs themselves or what we perceive as the individual moral failures that we ignore the complexities of substance use as it's simply too challenging. This is what COSU has spent the last well over a year digging into and really working on finding solutions for. Those who have worked in this field for more than a decade continue to see new generations of the same families struggling with similar challenges. They are struggling due to generational poverty and trauma that they have grown up in. Drugs are not the problem, and they're not the answer either. 
But when we look around our community and see drug use happening in plain view, we are seeing people who have suffered and they've found a substance that's helping them to feel better, whether that's for a short time or prolonged periods. At Groundworks, we're often asked when a new face appears, first of all, where they came from, I promise you it's still this community, most often than not. We're also asked which came first, the, the chicken or the egg theory? Was it mental illness or was it substance use? And the easy answer is that we don't know. And quite honestly, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but what we do here are people's really painful stories. They always include trauma, whether it's experiences or a lifetime. It often starts in childhood and follows people throughout their entire lives. While the COSU may not be at the core of the following needs, our goal is to support and elevate new and existing efforts to solve them. To do this, we need to improve housing options, which includes recovery and sober housing, safe housing, affordable housing, and accessible housing. We talk a lot about Great River Terrace in the community, and I and many others are really proud of the work that's gone on there, but it's not a single solution. We need housing across a continuum to meet many different needs that we see. We need to improve creative transportation options, including public transit and public funding for treatment and recovery transportation. As you've heard, oftentimes people need to seek treatment outside of our community because it doesn't exist here, and it's really hard to get to Bradford, Vermont. It is a very long way. There is no public transportation that gets you there. We need to ensure a clear Wyndham County economic development plan. We need to support and improve investment and access to physical spaces, community events, and activities that are open to all people. We also need to improve access and availability to services. Some examples of things that are working. We often spend so much time focused on the things that were challenged with our community that we forget to talk about what is working and how we've gotten to those solutions. Great River Terrace is a permanent supportive housing model it's built on an evidence-based model that's existed for many years and is employed across our, our country and our world. It is not rocket science. It's located on Putney Road in the former Lamplighter Motel building, and it includes what we call the three-legged stool of support. With 22 apartments provided by Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust, supportive services provided on-site by Groundworks Collaborative and HCRS, and housing vouchers provided by the Vermont State Housing Authority. In addition, at Groundworks, we found that the folks that we serve often have been stigmatized and discriminated against for so many years that accessing services is incredibly challenging. In response to this challenge, we've created HealthWorks, which is an embedded provider model. It's a community collaboration to place key support people on site where we serve clients, which is the literal definition of serving clients where they're at. It's not meant to create an alternative system of care where folks are now forever seeking services on site with us. It's an opportunity for us to help people access services where they need to be accessing them, whether that's through local doctor's offices, the hospital, mental health providers, and to cut down on the stigma that they might feel walking in the door to access those supports. This program currently includes an embedded clinical social worker from the retreat, a registered nurse from Battle Memorial Hospital, and a current open position with HCRS to provide addiction services on site. As we highlight all of the collaborations that we're working on and we're working towards, there's also many that have continued on in our community for years. Some of the exciting ones most recently are the recent addition of three porta potties in downtown Brattleboro, which is literally helping people who have no other place to go to the bathroom. There is no infrastructure uh, need, I think, that is as important as that. Some may not realize that while Groundworks operates the seasonal overflow shelter, this is a program that includes the entire community, and we're especially grateful to the town of Brattleboro and Winston Prouty, as well as other stakeholders who have worked to help to ensure the shelter has a home every year. The irony is never lost on us that for the past four years, our homeless shelter hasn't had a permanent home. We also spend a lot of time in the community working with coordinated entry, a single point of entry system for those experiencing or at risk of homelessness, where providers take on the role of coordination rather than asking individuals 
in need to knock on multiple doors, having to retell their story over and over. This is also a tool that can help us to identify data needed to create plans and programming to address homelessness in our community. Thank you, Anna. So those are the five action areas that we are proposing and outlining for our community to connect, to collectively uh, rally around. And I encourage folks again to take a look at the handouts uh, and grab some on your way out. Um, so the last two speakers that we have, we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about what's next. Where do we go from here? How do we resource these actions? and uh, where do we all need to galvanize ourselves. Uh, so I want to invite uh, Kate Lamphere to the stage. Kate is a family member of people in active use and recovery and the director of adult services for healthcare and rehabilitation services uh, who holds the fiscal um, sponsorship for the grant. I've deeply enjoyed Kate's nuanced look at how all of these pieces fit and has a dizzying knowledge of systems and services. And, uh, um, I, wanna, uh, and I want at least half of Kate's energy. <laughs> so please welcome to the stage, Kate Lamphere. I tried not to look back behind me because there are so many people here and uh, makes me a little, a little anxious. Uh, I told the COSU members, you'll know I'm nervous if I'm up here dancing and I'm having a hard time not moving. So I'm the Director of Adult Services at HCRS. I'm also, um, I belong to a family that has been deeply impacted by uh, opiate use, including the loss of my mother's youngest brother while he was incarcerated. And as Chad said, I have many family members, I might cry, in varying stages of active use and short and long-term recovery, of which I um, am very proud of all of them and their, their efforts to achieve wellness, define and achieve wellness. Um, so before the COSU was formed, a group of committed people received an email that said, hey, there's this thing happening, there's this grant. I think we should go for it. And I was, I don't know, about a month into my position, and I said, sure, I'll show up. And I was on a phone call where people were describing, um, you know, this HRSA planning grant. And then somebody said, so who wants to be the fiscal agent? There was silence on the phone. And I said, HCRS can do it. And then later that afternoon, I called George, our CEO, and said, so I did this thing, and I think we're going to be the fiscal agent. And he, of course, said, absolutely, hands down, whatever it takes, we'll do it. And so this group of committed people spent many, many hours putting together a proposal to HRSA um, for which we were awarded a planning grant that has supported the work thus far that got us to this place of the strategic action plan that you heard about. Um, and recently, I, we, we, uh, the COSU received a HRSA, um, do I have to click? No, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for click. We'll see. Okay, um, we received an implementation grant that will allow us to continue the work, to put the strategic action into action. Um, and there was tears and excitement and joy and jazz hands from all of us um, as we were awarded that grant. And then we were like, oh boy, now we've gotta do this work. So HCRS continues to be the fiscal agent for the project. I'm gonna breeze through this. Um, HCRS is the local designated agency serving Windsor and Wyndham County. We are a preferred prider, provider with ADAP. We have lots of staff. We do mental health care, substance use, developmental services, residential and emergency treatment. And we are the fiscal agent for the COSU. So we staff the project director and any additional um, uh, staff that come on as a result of the implementation grant. And we provide the administrative support. So we administer the grant. We provide the photocopiers and the office, and we support um, this project, and we're really proud to do so. So going forward, as I said, we have the uh, HRSA implementation grant, which will fund many of the initiatives over the next three years. But I think it's really important to note that all of the COSU partners came together when we were writing this, this proposal and said, we want the money to go to the community. 
And so every partner is donating time, energy, resources, so that the HRSA implementation money can really be directed to the community. And that's a big deal, because we all are doing so many things out in the community, and we, we recognize that by coming together, we might be able to create some level of a safety net, and we might be able to have an impact on this project. And so I'm so thankful to all of the partners who have really put so much energy into this um, process. So we also have been awarded a Vermont Department of Health CDC um, grant as part of the new state grant that just came through. We were one of four community initiatives across the state was selected to receive this funding, funding to support the work of the COSU. I think this is a group of people in Atlanta, right? I didn't go on this trip. So looking forward, as you heard about the strategic action plan, we really are focused on um, ensuring that we have an equity lens, that we are addressing the systemic causes that disenfranchised people um, experience that increase their risk of harm from substance use, including race, poverty, uh, sexism. The COSU believes that this is fundamental to addressing this problem. We're going to use some strategy. It's really important that this, this plan is strategic and we measure outcomes. We're going to increase advocacy. We're going to use the platform of the COSU to advocate for the needs of our community, communities. And we're going to make sure that we have the resources available to do it, including staffing um, for all of the community needs as the data points us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so our final speaker of the afternoon morning um, is going to spend a minute talking about, a few minutes talking about where do we go from here um, and what's next. Um, so let me welcome Jedediah Pop to the stage. Jedediah is a person in recovery and case manager at HCRS. He is also no stranger to the stage and recently just finished another successful year of co-organizing Run for Recovery, uh, which I am happy to say I finished, um, despite the hills. Um, so please welcome Jedediah to the stage. actually been on stage though. Um, so I'll, I'll share just a, a real quick anxiety producing story. Um, about 3.30 I was woke up by my uh, fire alarm and then I fell back asleep. And um, four, about four o'clock I woke up from this dream. I used to be a chef in my previous life. Every once in a while I'd have like this dream that my line wasn't set up um, before service and I'd be running around crazy trying to get things set up. Um, so, so these two, my two professions kind of <clears throat> mingled last night in this dream where for some reason I was cooking food for this event today <laughs> and Chad called me up on, up on stage and I was covered in ketchup and burger juice. Um, so I'm glad I didn't have that. I woke up and I'm like, oh, God. Um, so I, I'm going to share just a little bit about myself um, and then what's next. Um, so, so like Chad said, I'm a person in recovery. I'm a caseworker at HCRS. Um, uh, seven and a half years ago, I was sleeping in front of uh, Sleepy's mattress in the open corridor, um, picking up bottles, trying to, to, to get money. Um, for cigarettes. So uh, I've come a long way. It's, it's taken me a lot to, to acknowledge that, um, but I wouldn't be here um, for only because of these people here and the agencies that they work for. Um, and, you know, a couple barriers I had to overcome that relates to what we're talking about today is, um, you know, when I was actively using, I would develop 
um, infections and I would uh, you know, get ill because of my, my substance use um, and early recovery, I had to go a, to, to a lot of places to try, try to find the right supports and resources. It was really, really tiring. Um, and, and, and lastly, uh, I was judged because of my substance use disorder. Um, and sometimes that was in my head of, of feeling like I was being judged, um, but it also contributed to the low self-esteem and, and the lack of self-worth um, that I felt. Um, and that all relates to everything that we talked about today. Um, when I first heard about this assessment and an implementation grant, I, I was like, man, I really want to be involved with this as much as I can, um, like I am with a lot of things, but I can only do so much. Um, and I w I'm just so lucky that Chad and the rest of the COSU um, had this goal to be inclusive for those who um, live with substance use disorder, and that my employer, HCRS, um, encouraged me to, to come aboard and are doing what they, they can do to help support me, which I, I'm very grateful for that. Um, so it kind of did, did um, the opposite of what judgment did. Um, so this has given me a lot of meaning and purpose in my life, and it's given me opportunities for my voice to be heard and to um, speak for those with lived experience or that are still uh, in active. So um, that, that has, uh, it's a great honor to be part of this. Um, I'm part of the advisory board and the full COSU. Um, so this event today is the first event. Um, so what we're gonna essentially be doing um, because we, when I looked at the grant and the assessment and the strategic plan, and I'm like, a lot of stuff. And a lot of stuff I don't understand about it. Um, but I hope to understand more and more as I uh, get further into this. Um, so we, it's too much information to share today. We did a, a fantastic job at trying to get the meat of that down for you. Um, so, but there's still bits and pieces that, that can uh, share more on. So what we're, we're pointing at the, the road show. Um, so we're going on the road throughout the county. Um, and what, what our, our goal is, is just to help communicate, uh, to communicate information to you all and to re the rest of the county, um, but also to get information. Um, so we're gonna be having question and answer sessions, like the, the one we're gonna have today here in a second if I'm quick. Um, so we're gonna be doing that throughout the whole county. Um, and uh, because it really is like we found a lot out and we have a lot to communicate. Um, so we hope that there's um, people, you know, today that stay for the Q and A, but also when we go on the road. Um, you know, so dude, if you all can just share that, um, we would be really grateful. Um, so, uh, I think it was Becky um, and Ella, maybe. Um, but a couple of people referenced that we're already doing a lot um, in, the, in the community to help get us through this challenge in time. Um, but what we want to do, what our next step is, is to take that and build upon that. Um, we want to uh, build upon those partnerships and programs and put forth our efforts to continue these actions within existing activities and resources. Um, however, it will be necessary for us to start new collaborative initiatives using the HRSA grant and the VDH slash CDC grant that Kate talked about a few minutes ago. Um, we're doing a, a fantastic job uh, to, to be inclusive to people with substance use disorder or that are impacted by substance use disorder. Um, but we realize that we um, need to broaden our membership. So we have a design team that's been working for the past couple months um, and that is going to continue to work um, to put together um, what the overall structure of POSU is going to look like, um, who the members will be, how often we'll meet, um, to, to, to put everything into action. 
Um, our, the, the roadshow will focus on having presentations and discussions with select boards and community groups throughout the whole county. We will be going back to the communities where we held the um, focus groups and the forums and bringing them back information and continuing, again, continuing to get information from them and to build upon that, those relationships, because those focus groups and forums are, are very important to continue. Um, and uh, so essentially, um, again, I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record here. We're going to be building upon and strengthening connections. Um, we're going to be collaborating like we've never done before. Um, and I'd like to use the word awesome. And it's awesome what we're already doing. Uh, to, to, for me to be able to sit at these tables with all these folks that know so much about what they do is awesome. So once we build upon that, um, and we collaborate more, we make more connections, more resources. Um, I'm going to have to come up with a new word besides awesome. Um, and lastly, um, one thing that I took away from the process, and, and, and the others did, um, and, and something I'm sure you all know, is that we have to make real change. Um, we intend to do this by engaging with our ele uh, elected officials to prompt policy change at the local, state, and federal levels. Um, we, we look forward um, to, to meeting with those folks, and we look forward to having those conversations. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. And thank you, Chad. Thank you to the whole folks who. Thank you. Thank you, Jedediah. And a number of those elected officials that Jedediah mentioned are here today, and we appreciate their, um, their willingness to be here and have inspired us um, to be thoughtful about how we approach. So um, I'm going to ask folks, I know it's getting close to time, we ran a little over schedule, but we distilled a year's worth of work in uh, an hour and 45 minutes. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. So I'm going to invite folks to come to the stage. We're going to do a Q&A session for about 10, 15 minutes uh, and then wrap up. Uh, so folks could come to the stage. Um, we've got a lot of chairs, a lot of voices, a lot of folks who have had a lot of experiences. Um, and so we want to hear from them um, and ask a few questions from the audience and from the press. As they're doing that and getting situated, I'm going to share a few things that really inspired us along the way. Um, so uh, if folks, and this presentation will be made available, um, I'll share how in just a minute. Um, so uh, there are a few things to listen to and to watch and to read and encourage folks to take those um, with them as you, um, as you leave today and, um, and be inspired. Um, so Johan Hari, as you had mentioned, as Deb had mentioned earlier, uh, Indigo Radio, uh, local radio on uh, our uh, local radio station, um, has a two-part series that's phenomenal. Uh, Dr. Carl Hart, The High Price, uh, and his TED Talk, and the TED Talk by Ch uh, Vir Virginia Fire Chief uh, Jan Rader. Um, also, some other resources, the 2019 VPR series, My Heart Still Beats, uh, the 28, uh, 2018 photo uh, exhibit that was mentioned earlier, and, of course, um, the seven-day series, Hooked, uh, by Kate O'Neill. So... We're going to spend just a minute, um, about, uh, 10 minutes, uh, doing a Q&A session. And I wanted to start it off by just saying we're going to model this process by how we've been modeling COSU and our discussions throughout the county over the last year. Um, so we ask that we assume best intentions. Sometimes we say things um, that come out of our mouth that might not feel right, but uh, we assume best intentions. Uh, the spirit of collaboration, collaboration has been a big uh, component of today, um, and that we ask people to um, step up and speak when uh, you might not feel comfortable speaking or if you feel like you um, don't often speak, and step, step back and step up if you speak a lot. Um, and we have an equity framework, and we represent all of Wyndham County. 
So um, with that, um, the first question I want to bring up, and as I ask this question, I'm going to ask folks to come to the microphones, which look really tall to me, um, but maybe that's just because I'm shorter. Um, so come up front and, uh, and ask any questions that you have. Um, but I'm going to start with the first question. Um, and Mel or Russell, if you want to take this uh, first part and then open it up, uh, you can. Um, can you describe how restorative justice frameworks and practices are and could play a role in addressing opioid and other substance use related issues? So, Mel, well, you want me to start and then, uh, okay. Okay. Right. Can you hear me? Do the microphones need to be turned on? Hello. Hello. Oh, there yeah. we go. Okay. Wow, I really do need to get up close to it. Okay. Um, so uh, my, my quick answer to that question is, uh, as you heard up here, both at the beginning video and it came up a number of times, that the, um, one of the things that really um, uh, works against overcoming addiction is judgment. And um, the criminal justice system is obviously based on judgment. Um, there's a judge that makes decisions for you, and, and that's what the whole system is based on. And what we know about addiction is that criminalizing does, addiction does not work. Um, I, th I think most of us could probably agree to that. Um, and my definition of rest restorative justice uh, programming is um, that it recognizes that many people who enter the criminal justice system um, have underlying factors that cause harm in our community. And so restorative justice focuses on repairing that harm and also at identifying and addressing um, the underlying issues uh, for those who committed the harm in community. And um, at Youth Services, by the way, uh, that's my name is Russell Bryberry Carl, and I'm the Executive Director of Youth Services. <laughs> the heck we skipped the introductions part, my apologies. <laughs> um, and at Youth Services, we run two restorative justice programs that focus specifically on um, substance use. We have a youth substance abuse safety program and pretrial. Um, and just to really give a quick summation of that, um, both of those programs allow people that may have an issue with addiction and are on, the, are on the edge of being pushed into the criminal justice system to be able to get an evaluation and then to be able to get um, support and referrals to get into recovery if needed. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that and maybe go I'll, bigger. I'll add just a little bit. Uh, my name is Mel Motel. I'm the director of the Brattleboro Community Justice Center along with Youth Services. Um, just a, such a wonderful collaboration to provide so many restorative possibilities in this community. I just want to give a couple of examples of what this, what this looks like in action. Um, and also just want to notice the quote that Deb shared earlier about the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, it's connection. And restorative justice is about connection. It's about connecting with the person who did the harm, connecting with the people who were harmed, and bringing the community in to, to grapple with what happened and how to make things right again. And I just want to give a couple of quick examples. I know we don't have a lot of time about, about what this looks like, what this, can, what this does look like around substance use. So we work with folks who are referred to us from the legal system, from the police, from the state's attorney, from the Department of Corrections, and we also work with people in communities at the neighborhood level, in schools, in families, and workplaces. And restorative justice can look like one of these two examples. One is um, we frequently work with folks who commit a crime or do something harmful because um, they are trying to get money to buy something that they can use. And what that looks like is folks come to us and meet with a group of community volunteers to talk about when that happened, okay, who was harmed? So maybe the store was harmed that you stole stuff from and we're gonna figure out how to fix that together. But we're also going to talk about what is going on for you. And we, through those community connections, we can have those conversations that make it not just about crime, but about relationships. Um, and we're not just working with folks who commit crimes because or related to their use. We're also working with people who sell. And I think that's really important, too, because so often we make a distinction of people who are deserving of restorative interventions and who aren't. But we work with people who have sold drugs, and we talk about who did you harm? How did that harm your kid? How did that harm your mom? How did that harm, harm your neighborhood? And how do we make it better? And also, what is happening for you? What happened to you? And we as a community are responsible mm. for dealing with that. And we can't push it off. We cannot push it off to the legal system and we cannot ignore it. We need to meet people in community. And that's, that's the power of restorative practices. And I think what we can do more of is, I think we can do more. And I'm also really interested in this idea that's come up a lot today around embedding 
We have three staff, and I think, Russell, you have five or six in your program, and between us we have 80 volunteers, but every day I get calls from neighborhoods, from families, from workplaces, saying, can you come here and help us deal with this? And I would love to see resources devoted to getting restorative justice folks into organizations and into spaces where we can intervene earlier so it does not get to the point where people are dealing with serious harm. So that's, that's my addition. Thank you for calling that into the room, Mel, because I think it's important as we leave today and what are actionable steps I heard an ask there, and I think that's I was, a role of COSU is to facilitate those ask and to elevate those things that can really have measurable impacts in our community. So to kind of piggyback from this and kind of blend this idea of what is accountability, it's a question I get a lot around what is accountability around substance use. Restorative justice can be an, uh, a, a piece of that. Can we talk a little bit about that component of connection and community as we move towards accountability and connection? Um, so I'm wondering if, uh, if folks can share a little bit about what role connection and community plays in recovery. Um, and I know Karen and JR spoke really well about that. If either one of you had anything to add to what you added or what you shared earlier. I think that the fire program in Bells Falls uh, pretty much saved my sanity. Um, Sarah Chard and Deb Whitkiss and Deb tried to get me to go there for years and I didn't. Um, I'm assuming because of the shame that I was dealing with. Um, I had three sons that uh, had substance use disorder for years from the time they were like eight years old. Um, they had mental illness. They've been in and out of uh, prison in the past. I have seven of my 16 grandchildren who have uh, mental health issues, who have substance use disorder, and who uh, four of them have, are involved with the uh, criminal justice system. And I have raised four of those uh, grandchildren. So without the FIRE program, I wouldn't even be sitting here I probably would have done myself in. Um, I've had a couple of grandchildren that um, have overdosed, and one of my sons, and uh, I had a grandson uh, kill himself at age 16, and he was, uh, had mental illness, bipolar disorder. He was using substances and uh, ended up going into the woods with a shotgun and killed himself. So, so I've been through a lot. Um, dealing with the substance use disorder uh, issue. And I'm just really glad that I've got the FAR program in so, Bell's Falls. So FAR has been a phenomenal piece. Uh, LRJR, and then we do have a question from the crowd. All right, I am so out of my element. <laughs> <laughs> you got this. Hello, everybody, and, and I tell you, Accountability question is so important. Me, as a person in recovery, probably as important as my abstinence is me being accountable for all of the things that are associated with my substance use disorder, including the trauma that I went through as a child. And, you know, I've been arrested many times, and so that punitive aspect of arresting us, you know, the, the, the public saying, okay, you're accountable for the crime that you committed in pursuit of your drug or alcohol, you have to go to jail now. And that's fine, because there is, there's certainly a, set, a, a piece of that that accountability has to be, has to be ensured. Unfortunately, though, incarceration is, is problematic. It actually adds to the trauma. And there is no shortage of substances to be used in jails. So that's not necessarily the answer per se. Um, however, the connection that I made post-incarceration um, with people with organizations like CJC and um, Greater Falls Connections and you know the Phoenix House programs and and other institutions that are fighting this this war this this epidemic that we're in of uh, substance abuse you know that being the, the the sickest part of our society is really a sad story and the collaboration of all these organizations helping us um, hold ourselves accountable for our disease and getting treatment for it um, can't be understated at all, you know. Um, but 
Your self accountability is so important, and 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 I and I say to all of you that you need to hold the the people in your lives that have substance abuse disorder, hold them accountable, but do do so in, in a warm and compassionate way, because understand that they have a disease, that they're powerless over their actions, until they get the help that they need. Thank you. Thank you, Jr. We have a question from the crowd. Um, please stay your name and uh, what question you have. Hi, I'm Diane Derby. I'm with Senator Leahy's office. And quick comment and then a question, but my, my comment being, I just want to congratulate all of you who were a part of making this grant happen. It was pretty exceptional to get the planning grant from HRSA and then the implementation grant. You're the only community I know of in Vermont to get that that piece of that grant, and on top of that, the CDC grant. So you have done phenomenal work. In so it's, it's really special what you're doing. Um, my job is to be the eyes and ears in Vermont for Senator Leahy, and uh, what I set out to do is really find out where the gaps are so we can address that in his work on the Appropriations Committee to bring more federal funding in. So one quick question, I would have two two part question perhaps. One, I'm always looking for where gaps are. I'd be a little curious whether you're starting the rapid access low barrier in your emergency room or emergency department if that's something on your radar because we've seen some real successes around the state on that. And and two, um, plans for family resources. Um, when I travel around the state, the biggest, I had a meeting with Kate O'Neill, who you've referenced today, from seven days, and I said, if there's one gap that exists that you could plug, what would it be? And she said, as a family, we just didn't know where to turn, and there was no kind of comprehensive family resource manual for this problem. Mm -hmm. So I guess on those two parts, those are the gaps that I hear about, and I'm just wondering if that's part of the work COSU's doing. And thanks again for all you've done. And thank you. And before Becky jumps in, I just want to say thank you to uh, Diane and uh, Senator Leahy's office, Senator Sanders' office, and Congressman Welch's office for being a fierce advocate for us and helping us um, elevate our application to the federal government. So thank you. Um, Becky, would you want to touch on the, the ED program? Sure, absolutely. So Batterbur Memorial Hospital has started a pilot project where we are identifying people in active withdrawal that come into the emergency department and providing them with medication-assisted treatment. It's not just about providing a medication, it's also about the collaboration with the Brattleboro Retreat and, and providing that warm handoff so that people that come into the emergency department and are struggling don't have to jump through those hoops. So we've started this program. We have had, the last, last numbers that I've, that I've seen, we've had five successful transfers and initiation of, of medication-assisted treatment in the emergency department and five warm handoffs for people to the hub at the Broadway retreat and all five people have showed up. And that is huge. Mm. And we couldn't have done that without the collaboration with the retreat and also the Turning Point Recovery Coaches because they go out and they connect with people um, and, and ensure and assist and help get them to their destination, which would be the hub program at that time. So again, this is a really amazing um, pilot project that we, are, that we are doing and we are really, really proud of it. And I just wanna thank Taylor Wellington, the emergency director, the director of emergency services at BMH, and also Matt Dove, who have worked tirelessly to make this happen. Thank you, Becky. Yes, and Kurt would like to talk again. So I'm going to ask that we limit our comments to just a mi real brief comments because we are unfortunately getting to the end of the program. So um, any I last thoughts? In some time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add uh, very uh, uh, practically that we did put in 
uh, money in the implementation grant to help improve those very collaborations uh, to get uh, to sort of expand the work we're doing and to have clinicians involved in supporting physicians in the emergency room at BMH as a collaboration as well as at Grace Cottage Hospital in the ER and in the practices there and even conceivably in the surrounding community. So it's a, so we've, we've done a lot with the little that we had and we're, we actually uh, put it in there and, and got some uh, money for it. So there you go. Yeah, I'll let go ahead. Um, and then as for supporting families um, struggling with substance use disorder uh, and recovery, um, uh, the Turning Point in Wyndham County actually has just got a grant um, for a, a pilot program uh, called the Moms Recovery Support Network that's going to serve as an expansion of the existing supports that we have already for um, moms and parents in recovery. Um, right now we have uh, groups for moms, uh, you know, with substance use disorder. We're starting a partner-supported group, um, hopefully in November, for um, moms and dads with substance use struggles. And we're taking, talking about embedding services, we're taking one of these groups and we're embedding it at the Morningside long-term shelter that ground, Groundworks runs here in Brattleboro. Um, so we're giving a lot of care and attention to that issue. It's really for myself. Um, I've got a 21-month-old 21, 21 and um, that the stress and challenge and difficulty and responsibilities of being a parent have have strained my recovery um, mm. more than really anything else. And um, I have been so grateful to be plugged in and connected and supported by so many of the people that are up here right now um, that I want to be able to give that opportunity to other parents so that they they can have the same opportunity to be there and show up for their kids um, for their kids' lives and for their own. So, and one last thing I wanted to say that um, just about connection um, for me right now in my recovery, um, recovery to me means when I wake up in the morning, um, I look forward to the day that I have ahead of me, um, and when I go to bed at night, I feel I feel good about myself, um, and I know that for myself in addiction. Um, negative motivators were really powerful. Um, not wanting to go to jail, uh, not wanting to disappoint other people, um, but that fear only held me for so long. Right now, it's it's getting to wake up in the morning and be there um, for my kids to have breakfast and not be looking at my phone and thinking, oh, did this person call? Do I have enough money for this? To show up for my life and to have these relationships, these connections are the things that fuel my recovery and make my life um, something that I'm excited about when I wake up in the morning, so. Yeah. Thank you, Ella. Thank you. So do we have, um, we're going to take one last question. Cindy, do you have a question? Go ahead. Hi, my name is Cindy Hayford. I'm with the Deerfield Valley Community Partnership in the Wilmington area. And first of all, I wanted to commend you on all your work getting these grants, reaching out to the rural communities. Um, I have to thank you because it's the first time really ever that we've had the folks from Brattleboro coming to the Wilmington area on a regular basis to give us support. Um, I come from a youth substance abuse prevention coalition, and um, when I look at the COSU, I see that you're talking about the continuum of care, but I do have to say that a missing piece for me is discussion about the early onset of substance abuse, of any use. And when I look at the panel, I'm not seeing that represented. And so my question is, where does the primary prevention piece fit into this whole COSU? You know, it almost feels like an afterthought on here. It's listed as school, you know, supporting schools. So if someone could address that. Sure, Deb, I'm wondering if you could address that and then also just uh, to highlight the, the social determinants of health is a really a, a clear way for us to, to talk about some of the um, multi-generational and tr trauma, and so addressing social determinants of health or, or is prevention. But I'm wondering if, if Deb, you would want to jump in here. Uh, sure. Um, once again, my name is Deb Woodkiss. I'm with Greater Falls Connections. And um, thank you so much, um, Cindy, for bringing that uh, point forward. Mm -hmm. I am very passionate about prevention. And I'm so sorry. I was so nervous when I spoke. But I want what I wanted to say was um, um, recovery is the answer. Treatment works. And prevention is also a really powerful piece here. Um, we do, um, one thing that we, we've got to stop doing is having the silos. And we have to have a cross-discipline um, approach um, to this opioid epidemic. And prevention is extremely important. Um, the type of prevention we're doing up in Bellows Falls right now is actually teaching youth 
how to lead um, uh, community building um, circles, how to do restorative justice, how to, we, we, it's embedded in everything that we do, teaching them about the con continuum of use, teaching them about generational trauma, their own trauma, teaching them about risk and protective factors. Um, so it is embedded in everything um, that we do. And in fact, I would have to say, I, I agree with Cindy, we could do a better job mm -hmm. at doing a more integrated approach here. Because um, I know I've been working for a long time now with the turning point of Springfield, thanks to Mike Johnson, who inspired us to do this two-generation approach. Um, and, um, oh, I just lost my thought. <laughs> That's... <laughs> That's so me. But what I'll, I'll try to be quick, Chad, is that um, when we are um, cross-pollinating and designing these programs creatively with directly impacted people, this room is filled with professionals. Mm -hmm. I love you all. You're my colleagues. But this room needs to be filled with people who are not being paid to be here. Mm. They are the ones who should be informing our practices and, and helping us to design policies. The families I've worked at are the experts in harm reduction. They are the experts in prevent. You've, like the kids that I've been able to work with, who I love so dearly, they have taught me what prevention means. I have a great understanding conceptually. I can read, I could probably write a really good paper um, and get it published with the CDC. Um, but, those are the people who need to be centered in our efforts. Their voices, their experiences need to be informing us all. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, and no apologies. Okay. Thank you for the question. So with that, I apologize. We've asked everyone to come up on stage, but we are gonna have to wrap up today, and we will continue this conversation as Jed and I had talked about. Um, in going out to the road show. So please um, thank everyone that we came on stage this afternoon. So as, as we leave today, I just want to give a couple of thank yous uh, before we, we exit and some encouragement. I want to thank Molly. Uh, Molly was uh, answering my text uh, late at night, early in the morning. I want to thank her for getting this uh, all put together. I want to thank all of the members of COSU. Um, if, if you are in the crowd, please stand up. All of the work groups, uh, I want you to just stand up and how much effort and work and passion went into this last year. So thank you all um, and those who are standing. Um, the, the grant writing team that went into this, I don't know if she's here at all, Maggie Foley, you are amazing in pulling us all together. This was an intense uh, 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 example of collaboration and I wanna thank the team that pulled all of this together all over the country we were uh, at that time, so thank you all. Um, I again want to thank the Latches Theater um, and, for, and John Potter for hosting today, uh, BCTV for filming and streaming this live, um, and um, I invite everyone to come to the turning point of Wyndham County. Uh, we're going to have a reception and tour immediately following this at 39 Elm Street here in Brattleboro, so please join us. Um, I'll be bouncing right over there after this myself. Um, so we talked about a lot of themes today and we came up with some con uh, concrete actions for, for our community to take and to ponder. Um, and what's, how I wanted to kind of leave today is, um, I've had, in living in, in Brattleboro, I've had this, this um, tremendous felt sense of being held. And it's, um, it's been a, a wonderful, positive experience. I feel like I have layers and layers of people behind me and my family has layers. And I feel like that's what we need of our services and our systems and, and be able to show up for people is to hold people. And our community can be a place where we hold each other. And that has a lot of different meanings. And so I leave and we leave encouraging us all to hold one another, be patient with one another, meet people where they're at, and our, um, our services and our systems will follow if we show up in that way. So um, please join us at Turning Point for the reception, and thank you all for staying and being with, here, uh, with us here today. Thank you.